lifesaver thrombolytic drug clot specific streptokinase which is india's first biotherapeutic molecule which is not a biosimilar these are only a few of his long list of significant contributions to science his work has been published in reputed international peer reviewed journals Dr. Sani has been awarded with several distinctions, such as the prestigious National Biotechnology Product Development Award, CSI Technology Shield, the Vasvik Industrial Award, Ranbaxy Award in Pharmaceutical Sciences, Vigyan Ratan Award, Sri Om Prakash Basin Award, CSI Technology Award for Business Development and Technology Marketing, to name a few. Dr Sahani is a fellow of various organizations such as the Indian National Science Academy Indian Academy of Science National Academy of Sciences Association of Microbiologists of India and a member of Guha Research Conference he was also a Bhatnagar fellow at CSIR Imtech we are honored to have with us today a distinguished scientist amongst us May I now invite Dr. Sahani to address the gathering on this occasion and also introduce our chief guest, Professor P. Balram, to the audience and invite our guest, chief guest, for the plenary lecture. Thank you. <clears throat> Professor Balram, esteemed scientist. think leader administrator it's a great privilege to be welcoming you here today i've been a student at isc i've attended your lectures and they formed some of the first serious foundation stones in my career opening my eyes to the wonder of serious science and inquiry dr dulal panda personal friend admirable scientist man of distinction now leader of this esteemed institution several other dignitaries on the dais shri tingal dr bansal dr sharma it is my privilege today ladies and gentlemen esteemed guests all the students who have come here directors of niper faculty of this institution and elsewhere all the speakers and participants i hope that we all have a fun time three days of deliberations discussions fermentation if you will and the generation of new ideas let us nucleate new ideas the germs of new experiments and projects and go back to our labs and continue to do great work nipers have a very special position today in the whole scenario now the nipers the original niper was niper mohali that experiment worked it became a great institution and showed the way and paved the way for several new nipers today as india has been recognized throughout the world as the pharmacy of the world and the fact is that it is rooted in science process development innovation of a very special sort our chemists did a great job hand held with industry and given the policy openness and the ipr let us say permissibility to generate process patents india stands today as a very special pinnacle the great challenge as mr <coughs> tingal also mentioned the next challenge is to go ahead and become innovators of new molecules new chemical entities new pharma entities and where china has shown the way i think india with its immense intellectual strength with its infrastructure with its academic institutions and now new policy initiatives i have no doubt that not only this institute not only all the nipers but the hand holding that we need to do between institutions and government and industry that will finally come to fruition and it will actually produce great results and i wish and pray to god that such a thing happens sooner than later and this is just a great beginning today we are all assembled here and we might want to reflect actually deeply how do we catalyze this how do we actually encourage critical thinking innovative thinking hand holding with industry wherever possible encouraging students to take up leadership roles and do serious science and today we gentlemen ladies and gentlemen we have a serious scientist who has paved the way for virtually three generations not because he is old 
but he started young and made rapid progress. I don't want to embarrass him, but he's an institution. All of us Indian scientists, especially in biology and chemistry, look at Professor Balram and marvel with a little bit of awe, but always with great affection. He is accessible, he partakes of his thinking, he is now on the social media also, very, very nice to see, sharing his insights with everybody, especially students. I encourage everybody to go and explore that social media space, video space, where he has talked about so many interesting phenomena that bridge chemistry with biology. Professor Balram's accomplishments will take a whole file to enumerate. He has been recognized by all of the Indian Science Awards, by all of the civil awards till Padma Bhushan. Also, he was the I director of IIC, one of our greatest, in fact, our greatest institutions for R&D. The statesman-like qualities that he has, on the one hand, and pincer-like vision for critical evaluation and micro-thinking to get scientific discoveries come out is his hallmark, and we all admire him for that. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a round of applause for him. As a protein and peptide person, I want to mention that Dr. Balram has been recognized by the Robert Bruce Merrifield Award, Lifetime, Lifetime Achievement Award of the American Peptide Society. It's a very coveted award. And of course, many, many more. His contributions to peptide confirmation, everybody knows. He has approximately 350, 400 papers, but that's not the point. The point is he has actually opened up many fields. He has opened up several fields, quite different from each other. And that is a hallmark we would all like to emulate, maybe in my next lifetime. But, um, Welcome him, let us welcome him, and let us listen to his lecture on very special form of peptides uh, from snails. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. May I now request Chairman Bioji, Dr. Sahani, Joint Secretary, Shri Rajneesh Tinga, Director, Naipur S.S. Nagar, Professor Panda, Organizing Secretaries, Professor Arvind Bansal and Professor S.S. Sharma to join the audience for the lecture. Sarun. Thank you, sir. Sarun, call your mic. Yes, this is better. Oh, this one. Yes. Signal, yeah, Lapel check. Okay, before I start, could I have the first slide on? Uh, excuse me, sir. So, mic is not on. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay. This doesn't seem to work. Hmm? This is not working, I think. Doesn't matter. No. Check. Check. You can't hear it. It's okay. Use this. Uh, could I have the first slide on, please? Uh, no, good morning. I'd like to begin by thanking. Uh, Professor Dulal Panda and uh, the organizing committee of this conference 
for inviting me to come here. I was originally invited to uh, give a lecture and Professor Dulal Panda also suggested to me that I should talk on uh, cone snail peptides on which I have been working for some years. But then a couple of days ago, he called me again and told me that the minister who was supposed to be the chief guest here has unavoidably been detained in Delhi and therefore would I now consent to be the chief guest. This of course is one of the perils of advancing age and mounting seniority that in the absence of a genuine chief guest, you can be called upon to substitute for them. And that's what I will do. I will make a few general remarks uh, which chief guests are supposed to make uh, before I go on with my technical presentation. Uh, pharmaceutical research really straddles a very long border between chemistry and biology. This is almost like the border between India and China. Very long, and many places, the line of actual control is not properly defined. So chemists can go into biology, and biologists can get into chemistry. Both subjects are essential for pharmaceutical research, and the importance of pharmaceutical research has been emphasized by the pandemic of the last two and a half years. Now what the pandemic of the last two and a half years has taught everyone is that the forces of nature are not easily controlled. And the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, which caused the COVID-19 pandemic, is indeed a force of nature. Just imagine, a hundred years ago, we had the influenza pandemic of 1918 that lasted about two and a half years. A century later, after all our advances in chemistry, physics, biology, and medicine, the coronavirus pandemic of 2019 has also lasted for two and a half years. It's exacted a huge death toll, and a huge number of people have been infected. This should tell you that never ever underestimate biology, never ever underestimate the forces of nature. Bacteria, viruses, uh, failures of your own biology which lead to metabolic disease, all these are really forces of nature. And pharmaceutical research is critical in sort of improving uh, the health of the population. Nipers are in a very important space. They cover the two areas which deserve far more funding in India, public funding, that is health and education. Because you are educating students in the areas which will take them into pharmaceutical industry or into pharmaceutical research or into academia. At the same time, you are also carrying out research which will hopefully be important in uh, control of diseases in the future. So I hope that you have a wonderful conference and that bringing together so many students, uh, scientists, both from academia and industry, will inspire students to look well beyond the ideas that they had before they came to the conference. With those introductory remarks, I will now move to the subject of my presentation. What I'm going to talk about is really on cone snail analogues of the pituitary hormones oxytocin and vasopressin. All of you will be familiar with the pituitary hormones, but I will make some general remarks as I go along. Oxytocin, of course, is found in the pharmacies, so is vasopressin. Now, the project itself is not of my creation. I, you will see that this is now subtitled as Research and Retirement. I have been retired for the last eight years, and therefore I have been working with uh, a minimal complement of uh, people, two postdocs, and uh, no laboratory. But nevertheless, I will show you that it is still possible to think, and it is still possible to do some research. Uh, the project itself is the brainchild of my late colleague, Professor K.S. Krishnan, uh, not only a neurobiologist, but a naturalist uh, par excellence, 
who brought the idea to me of working on cone snail venom. And you will see in a moment why cone snail venom is really important. Cone snails do not move very fast, and therefore in order to eat, they must immobilize their prey. So they produce a toxin, and the toxin consists of many, many peptides, all of which are paralytic in nature. And they paralyze prey and then engulf them. I think this also doesn't work. So can I have the next slide, please? Can you move the slide? Because this, yeah. On the, t on the top, you will find the most important statement for understanding what I say. Conotoxins are up to 50 residues in length, and cone-snail venom contains several hundred peptides of this length, which target almost every receptor and membrane channel at the neuromuscular junction, and thereby cause paralysis. Collecting cone snails is something that Professor Christian did with enormous enthusiasm in the years that he was with us. He died in 2014. So much of what I'm going to tell you is now going to be uh, based on the research that I've done since. Can I have the next slide, please? On this slide, I show you the starting point of the field. The field itself uh, was initiated by Professor Oliveira, a Filipino scientist who actually started this field in the Philippines after seeing that cone snail stings caused fishermen to die. So they had very potent venom. Oliveira moved to the University of Utah in the United States and then did this remarkable experiment where he collected venom separated it on the HPLC and took every HPLC fraction and did intracerebral injections into mice. And then he monitored the behavior of the mice and he found that the mice had all kinds of behavior that you see there. Some were paralyzed, some jumped, uh, some moved around in circles, all kinds of uh, phenomena were observed. So every HPLC component here now contained a biologically one or more biologically active substances which acted specifically at different points in the neuronal cells. Right, this still doesn't work. Yeah, now it works, I think, yeah. Okay, good, great. So there are many, many cone snails. Cone snails are a product of nature. There are at least 700 to 1,000 species of cone snails worldwide. Each one of them produces thousands of peptides, and therefore there's a lot of work to do. Most of these peptides are disulfide bonded, although increasingly uh, non-disulfide bonded peptides are being found. Most of them are heavily post-translationally modified, and therefore you, have, you can summarize the area as saying there are many snails, many peptides, and many enzymes involved in post-translational modification. Now, this doesn't move, so maybe you should move it from there. Next slide, please. Since they are disulfide bonded, you can have a different distributions of cysteines, and therefore you can have different covalent networks. Remember for the students here that if you have uh, two disulfide bonds, you can have three isomers, but if you have uh, Four disulfide bonds, you can have as many as 105 connectivities. So this is an exploding problem. So cone snails produce diversity by changing the nature of disulfide bonds that they have. And may, if I have the next slide, please. In many other ways, they also undergo mutations. What I show you on the top is the precursor protein sequence for the conotoxins. They're all made as uh, they are gene-encoded products. They are part of a large precursor protein, which has a signal sequence, a pre-pro region, and then the toxin region. And proteolytic processing now gives rise to toxins of different lengths. Mutations give rise to different sequence. So this sequence is hypermutable. There's also post-translational modification. Here you must remember that the cone snails are evolutionarily old. They're probably about 50 million years old. 
and most of the post-translational modifications that you will see here also happen in your own bodies. C-terminus amidation, which happens in all your hypothalamic and pituitary hormones. Proline hydroxylation, which is common in collagen and now more recently in hypoxia-inducible factors. N-terminus pyroglutamyl formation, which you will find in thyrotropin-releasing hormone. Gamma carboxylation of glutamic acid, which you will find in your blood clotting uh, process. Uh, tryptophan bromination is, of course, a characteristic of marine organisms. And most importantly, epimerization, where an L-amino acid becomes a D-amino acid, which is again a characteristic of cone snail peptides. Together with proteolytic processing at different points along this precursor, you can generate a very large number of peptides. This is what you would call a natural library of peptides. The common post-translational modifications of conotoxins I've summarized here, and this is largely for the students. The post-translational modifications like amidation, hydroxidation, gamma carboxylation, and pyroglutamic acid formation by glutaminal cyclase have all been studied. But today, if you want to analyze post-translational modifications, you would do it by mass spectrometry, which is the technique that I will use in the rest of my presentation. And so the diff when you add something to a residue, you change its mass. And therefore, this is the easiest way of studying post-translational modifications. All these peptides act at the neuromuscular junction, and they act at various membrane receptors and channels. So in fact, in the annual reviews of genomics and human genetics, there's an article with the title, The Toxicogenomic Multiverse, Convergent Recruitment of Proteins into Animal Venoms. So animal venoms are a very rich source of pharmacologically active peptides, and the marine uh, environment is a source of many exotic organisms. The first peptide to go into clinical practice and so far the only one is Econotide. And this happened from Oliveira's lab many, many years ago uh, in the United States. This is now used for extreme pain. Unfortunately, it has to be used uh, only by an intraspinal injection. Now here, for instance, is the chemical formula as biochemists represent it and as organic chemists represent it. This is sometimes the difficulty that you have in pharmaceutical research. Two groups of people come into pharmaceutical research, those who've come from bio biology and biochemistry and those who have come from organic chemistry and natural products chemistry. They write their structures in different ways. Today, you must think about this. Because it turns out today that if you are going to work with therapeutic proteins, whether, they are, whether it is streptokinase or granulocyte colony stimulating factor, or whether it is therapeutic antibodies, in all of these cases, these large proteins have to be analyzed exactly the same way as the small organic molecules of medicinal chemistry. They must have the same chemical constitution. And therefore, it is very important to use the most modern techniques of analysis, primarily mass spectrometry, in analyzing these molecules. Now, we have worked with a large number of peptides. I show you only some here. Uh, for example, all these sequences are from my own laboratory. These are from an Australian laboratory, which was investigating them for the acid, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. It turns out that one of these molecules failed in advanced clinical trials after phase two, and therefore, uh, proceeding with other molecules would require a considerable amount of effort. But I am, by uh, practice, inclination, and training, a basic research scientist. I have never, ever, made the mistake of promising anything. And uh, therefore, I only ask questions which are basic in nature. And one of the questions that you can ask is, why is there such diversity in the cone snail venom? Why has the cone snail evolved? Remember, if you're going to understand biology, the most important thing to understand is evolution. Darwin sort of looks out over our shoulders every time when we are studying biology. You must understand the evolutionary origin, not only of the pathogens which cause disease, but you must also understand the evolutionary origin of everything that you see around you. The Red Queen hypothesis put forward by Leif Van Wallen, a very eminent uh, ecologist, 
really summarizes this. He goes back to a favorite book of mine, Through the Looking Glass, the sequel to Alice in Wonderland, written by Lewis Carroll. In that, the Red Queen, Alice meets the Red Queen. They are on a big checkerboard, chessboard, and there in the distance she sees rooks, bishops, knights, kings, queens, all arranged. So she catches the Red Queen's hand and says, we are in a game, let's play the game, and they run around the board. After some time, Alice, who's a very good student, says, we've been running for a long time, but we seem to be in the same place. The Red Queen, who's a very good professor, she gives the answer. She says, now here, that's in the looking glass world, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. In fact, the directors of the Nipers will find that to move up in the NIRF rankings, whatever you do, you will find that after some time you're in the same place because everybody else is also running. Other people are not standing still. <laughs> now, if you apply the same logic to ev biological evolution, what we are looking at in cone snails is a classic example of a predator-prey relationship. The predator would like to eat the prey. The prey would not like to be eaten by the predator. And if the predator is producing peptides which are going to target prey receptors, prey receptors continually evolve. It's a process of selection. Those mutants which now don't get affected by the toxin will get selected out and multiply. The same problems that you have in bacteria for antibiotic resistance. So predator toxins and prey receptors evolve over time. And what I say here is, the more they change, the more their interactions remain the same. Because what are their interactions? They're the interactions between atoms and molecule, in molecules. And all you need to do is to change the positions of the atoms. And that is what mutation and selection does. So the interactions between atoms follow the immutable laws of physics and chemistry. And therefore, the more different the molecules you make, receptors, or eventually evolution will take care of it. Both predators and prey will come to a biological equilibrium. All of us who are unmasked here today are probably infected by the new strains of the coronavirus. Fortunately, it doesn't do us too much harm. What this means is that we have now come to a truce, an equilibrium, where the virus and we, all of us, coexist in nature. In sequencing peptides from natural mixtures, which has been my major activity over the last few years, uh, the major techniques are high-performance liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. Edmund sequencing is difficult because it is difficult in the first place and slow. Secondly, it's difficult when your peptides are blocked and post-translationally modified. So, and since conus venom is a complex mixture, we turn to mass spectrometry. Since there are disulfides, we reduce disulfide bonds, add n ethylmalamide or whatever else you have, iodoacetamide, uh, to block the thiols, and eventually measure the mass. A wonderful thing about chemistry is this, that in chemical reactions, except in isomerizations, you're either adding something or removing something, and therefore the mass always changes. So the mass spectrometer now becomes the most sensitive way of quickly deciding whether the reaction has gone or not, and you can very quickly estimate the number of... Ah, now this works very well. Works wonderfully well. Amazing. Sometimes there's a little lag, yeah. And uh, you can use Maldi mass spectrometry, which is the most elementary form of mass spectrometry, and you can see a mass is shifted from there to there, and um, you can divide by the amount, 228 is the number by which I'll be using, because I used n malamide, and you'll see this will give me three disulfide bonds. And uh, therefore it's very easy to find out how many disulfide bonds you have. Afterwards, sequencing peptides is... Uh, fragmentation along the amide bonds, and the most, you can fragment along other bonds. In fact, it turns out when you do this work, you will find unusual fragmentations, but that is a subject uh, which is only of use to those who are interested in mass spectrometry. There are four situations under which sequencing happens. Once you can sequence, you get enough fragments, you can sequence exclusively with mass spectrometry. This is rare. 
So you need to integrate other approaches, you need other data, and say for NGS data, transcriptomic analysis is what we use. And then we try to use a combination of mass spectrometry and transcriptomics to do our sequencing.